John chapter 11, and we're going to continue this study here in this incredible letter and gospel of John. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's one in front of you there in the pew. Love to have you follow along with us. John 11, and we're going to look at verses 45 through 57 here this morning. As you remember, we looked at the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead in our last study. And this resurrection created quite a stir in the city of Jerusalem. It stirred people up. And basically, as you read this, this account, this is what we're going to read here this morning is, is all of just John's commentary. There's no instruction here from Jesus. It's all John's commentary. And he basically explains and shows you how basically everybody is just kind of solidifying into their individual positions. And those that hated Jesus and those that loved him and believed in him. And how the Lord worked all of that out in people's lives and in this whole situation. John also gives us a little bit of a, a backroom insight into a conversation that takes place in the Sanhedrin and how they are deciding what they're going to do with Jesus. And many times people say, well, how did John know what was being said in the Sanhedrin? Well, there were disciples in the Sanhedrin that believed in Jesus. One of them was Nicodemus. And Remember, he came to Jesus by night and he was, it says, a secret disciple. And he most likely gave this information to John and the other disciples after the death and resurrection of Christ. So it was it's a very interesting thing here. He's setting, showing how the stage is being set for the crucifixion of Christ. So let's just read here. Verse 45. There John says, Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things Jesus did believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees and told them the things Jesus did. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered a council. And the word council there is the Greek word for Sanhedrin. And said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. The word works there is in the present tense, which means that he was continually working many signs. So doing miracle after miracle after miracle. And they said, if we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. So here John just gives you just a little introduction into the different attitudes, different views that people had toward Jesus, which is very interesting. I mean, he basically says here that there were people who believed in him. There were people who were just watching and then going and tattletailing to the chief priests and, and rulers. And then there were people that were plotting to kill him, to destroy him. And they were concerned about losing their own position and power. And so basically here, John gives us these different views. Now, these are the different attitudes that people have. When people come and encounter Jesus Christ, this is, these are the choices that they have. They're, they either believe what they have seen and heard, or they make a decision and they say, you know what, I'm just going to watch and listen. And then others who completely, totally reject him. And so when you share the gospel with people, those are the responses you're going to get. I believe, or let me wait and think about this. I'll talk to other people about it. And others, no way, I'm not into it. I don't believe this. And so it's an, it's an incredible thing to watch. Now Jesus when he did these miracles, people that stood there and watched, they believed. Now, 
I think to myself, if I was standing there and saw a man who had been dead for four days, raised to life again, duh, I would believe. <laughs> I mean, I would just go, okay, hey, this guy is the Messiah. Because nobody can, I mean, if, if Jesus had not called Lazarus' name, everybody in the graveyard would have come out of their graves. <laughs> Literally. And so, Jesus had the power to call this man out of his grave. And, I mean, why wouldn't someone believe? Now, this is, this is an important thing because I believe every single one of us has those answers to prayer in our personal life. We have uh, miracles that have taken place in our lives. And you need to remember them because these are the things that your faith is built upon. The actual proof that he is who he claims to be. You all have that proof. Every single one of you. If a person sees these things, hears these things, experiences them, they need to remember them. I have a little notebook in my, at where I study. And I, it's, I've got page after page after page of answered prayer and miracles that have taken place in this church over the years that I've been here pastoring. And it's, it's really an amazing thing. I, I go back and I just read through them. I put dates to them and, and I just go back and I read through them every once in a while. Because what it does is it just opens your eyes to the reality of how great your God is. And that he does things that no man can do. And so you have those things in your personal life. What are they? Would they and should they cause you to believe? I hope so. Just an encouragement. I, I think that you need to remember these things. When Jesus healed a man in Luke chapter 8, verse 39, he said to him, return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city what great things Jesus has done for him. Would to God that we would proclaim throughout our entire city the things that God has done for us. I mean, declare those things. Speak those, those things. Because people need to know them. They need to know God is at work he is alive, he is not dead, and he, he responds, he answers prayer, and he works, and he is active. Now others, are, it's so sad. I mean, can you think of these guys that just went and tattletailed to the chief priest? They're standing next to the Savior of the world, and they miss it. They miss it. And they turn around, and they... They miss what, what the Lord wants to do in their life. It's incredible how close people can be to the truth of the gospel, the truth of who God is, and still miss the message. And then there are those that question, what shall we do? What shall we do with this man? Now, this is a decision every single person on this planet has to make. When they come in and encounter Jesus Christ, they encounter the message of the gospel, they have to make a determination. They have to make a decision. What am I going to do? And that decision is made by every single one of us in this room. We, many of us have made that decision. If you're here and you haven't made that decision to follow Christ yet, well, I guarantee you, Jesus is not going to allow you to remain neutral. There's no neutral place with him. He, he will not let you stay neutral. Why do I say that? Because he says in Luke eleven twenty three, He who is not with me is against me. So you can't say it any clearer than that. There's no right in the fence with me. You're either with me or you're against me. He said, he who 
And he who does not gather with me scatters. And so once you are with him, then you're going to work with him gathering other individuals unto him. And that is our ministry, is a ministry of reconciliation, pleading in God's stead to those who do not know him to be reconciled to God. That is our, our desire. That is our calling upon our lives. Everybody needs to make a decision. And so people have said many times, Jesus, he's either a lunatic or he's a liar or he is the Lord. And really, those are your only options. When you hear the message and you hear the claims of Christ, I am the resurrection and the life. You have to make a decision. Is he crazy? Or is he lying to people to get something from them? Or is he the Lord? And a person has to make that personal decision. And so it's a decision that everyone must make, even right up until the very last day upon this earth. In the, at the final battle that takes place just before the second coming. Notice how the Lord portrays that in Joel 3, verse 14. He says, There are multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. So there's a decision to be made and the Lord will be Allow by His grace people to make that decision right up until the end before He returns. What a gracious and patient God we serve. And so there are two options for you. When the light of the truth of the gospel comes to you or to you share it with your family members, they are either going to accept it or they're going to reject it. They're going to come to the light or they are going to run from it. One of the two. There isn't anything in between. Now notice these individuals had a very specific motive. In verse 48, they say, if we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and take away our place and nation. So what are these guys worried about? What are they concerned about? They're going to lose their place, their position, their authority. You see, they're going to lose what they have. And that's all they're concerned about, is what is it going to cost me? Now, that is an important part of your decision, because there's always a cost when you choose to follow Christ. I'm going to talk a little bit about that cost as we go along here this morning. But there's always a cost, and... The good part, there's always a reward. There's a cost and a reward. And you have to weigh that in your personal life. Every one of us does. Here's where John describes both, both decisions in John chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. Notice, he said, He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. So, there is the decision to reject him. But as many as received him, there is the decision to receive him. To them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. Now why is it that many rejected and didn't receive him? Well, John tells us that reason as well in John 12, 42. It says, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. So they knew that they were going to be put out of the synagogue if they chose to believe in him. So there's the cost. They knew that this was going to be the result. They'd watched others excommunicated. We looked at that excommunication take place in John chapter 9, when Jesus healed the blind man. And that man stood before the rulers and testified to them, and they excommunicated 
him. They said, you're out of here. You're done. And what did Jesus do when he was rejected by them? He went and found him. I like that. You see, when people reject you, Jesus will find you. And he will minister to you and strengthen your hand every time. And so these guys are just, they're just worried about what they're going to lose. And yet, you know, some things are really good to lose. Okay? It's good to make the, the and experience the loss of some things. Because you're going to be put out of somebody's group, right? When you follow Christ, people are going to say, what? What are you doing? What, why do you believe this? You're nuts. You're, you're, I, don't, I don't even want to hang out with you. And especially if you're sharing the gospel with them, they don't want to hang out with you anymore. But that is the cost. That is what takes place. Now, what's the reward? Well, here's the reward. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18. Here is what Paul describes as this reward. He says, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. There is the reward. I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And so you have this opportunity to come into a relationship, a personal relationship with God, and he becomes your father, and he will receive you. He will listen to you. He will respond to you. That is the reward. In Matthew 16, verse 25, Jesus said, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Do you believe that? If you believe that, then you understand what the cost versus the reward of following Christ is is all about. But these guys, basically, they had to make a decision, and everybody makes a personal decision. You cannot force someone to make the right decision. They have to make it on their own. They have to decide. And you need to lovingly allow people to make that choice. If you force them into a decision, then you're going to have to force them to continue in that decision. Don't do that. It's not, it's not profitable. And it does not please God. Now notice verse 49. Here is the entrance of Caiaphas into this meeting. And it says, One of them, Caiaphas, being the high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. A little bit arrogant, I'd say. You know nothing at all. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Then from that day on, they plotted to put him to death. Therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews, but went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim, which is about 20, 30 miles north of Jerusalem. And there there remained with his disciples. And the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Then they sought Jesus and spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he will not come to the feast? Now both the chief priests and Pharisees had given a commandment that anyone knew, if anyone knew where he was, he should report it, that they might seize him. And so we see this this whole working behind the scenes of what's taking place. 
how the rulers are, are thinking and making their own decisions. And they have decided they're going to kill him. So Caiaphas's solution to the problem was let's not minimize Jesus. Let's not marginalize him. Let's just kill him. Let's just get rid of him. Sounds like a real religious guy, right? <laughs> you think to yourself, okay, where is this guy's head at? And it's all about power. It's all about money. It's all about his position. And Caiaphas, he was reappointed year after year. He was the high priest from 18 A.D. to 36 A.D. So long before Jesus came on the scene and shortly after he was on the scene. He was the high priest. And so he prophesies here not even knowing that he's prophesying. Now think about that for a minute. Just think. I mean, can somebody prophesy that is not a believer? Prophesy and not know that he's prophesying? Yes. And that's what John brings up here. He makes this point, I think, to just show you that, you know what? God is in control of this whole scene. More than Caiaphas understands, more than anybody understands. This is not some, you know, chance, haphazard decision making. This is, this is all planned out. And so it's, it really glorifies and magnifies the sovereignty of God. It declares and shows how sovereign God is over this whole scene. And so the people, the people, not only the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the chief rulers have decided to put him to death, but even the people themselves, they made the decision, we want him to die. In Matthew chapter 27, verses 24 through 26, here is a little insight into what took place just before the crucifixion. As the people are standing in the courtyard and Pilate is trying to convince them to let him go, and they won't have any of it. It declares there in Matthew chapter 27, verse 24, it says, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. So there's the testimony of an unbeliever to Jesus. He's a just man. But notice how unjust Pilate was himself. It says, he said, you see to it. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. And oh, it was. Then they released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. So if you really think somebody's just, a just man, an innocent man, why would you ever allow him to be scourged and then put to death? That's the greatest injustice that could have ever taken place. So this man reveals his character so well. But notice the people themselves. They say, let his blood be on us and our children. And the judgment for this action you see come 30 plus years later when the Romans come and destroy the city and the sanctuary and kill over a million Jews. I guarantee you, the guilt of what they did did come upon them. So a very sad decision. But it's a decision that they made. It's a decision every person makes. When people say, well, how can a loving God send anybody to hell? And I just tell him, look, a loving God doesn't send anybody to hell. It, it's not love for him to try and force someone into heaven who has hated him and lived apart from him and done 
whatever they please, it wouldn't be love for God to force that person into heaven and to be with him for eternity. That's not love. And so it's a decision that every man, every woman makes. Now God's solution to this problem was to take this hatred, this wrath of man, and to turn it completely around, which again, I believe, magnifies the sovereignty of God again, that God overrules all of these things. And he takes the wrath of man and he makes it to praise him. In Psalm 76, 10, there the psalmist declares, Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. With the remainder of wrath, you shall gird yourself. And so the wrath of man, how does the wrath of man praise God in this situation? It's very simple. His wrath, the wrath of the men and the people of that time that hated Jesus, the religious leaders that hated him, their wrath being taken out upon him was turned around to praise God in the end. How and why? Well, God would use the hatred of Jesus and he would use that as a means of saving the entire world. I mean, think about that. People say, well, if God was such a sovereign God, I mean, why didn't he work it out so that Jesus didn't have to die? Have you ever thought of that? Well, but that's impossible. He had to die. There isn't any other way for you to be saved. He took your penalty, the penalty for your sin, He was the innocent one, and that's the only one who can die for your sin, is the innocent one, the holy one, the just one. He's the only one who can. I can't die for you because I'm a sinner just like you. You can't die for me. There's nobody on this planet that can take your penalty. And God doesn't want to exercise his penalty upon men. He wants to exercise his grace upon men. So he takes the wrath of man and he turns it around and he uses it as a way to save men and bring praise to himself. I mean, that's why we we worship, is it not? That's the reason why we praise him, is it not? Because of what he's done for each of us and how he's changed us and transformed our lives. I had a man say to me just recently, I was talking to him about the incredible tragedies and struggle and problems that were in his life. And he said, you know, he said, Steve, I I went to this Bible study and this guy is talking about Romans 8.28. You know, that we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose. And he walked up to the pastor and he said, do you really believe that? And the pastor said, yes, I do believe that. And he said, well, how is this that's going on in my life going to work out for good? I mean, it's, it's tragedy. It's, I mean, it's just terrible. And he brought this up to me. And I said to him, I said, I believe that. I believe that God is going to take this incredible evil that's been done and he's going to turn it around for good. And then I proceeded to tell him, you know what, in my own life, this tragedy, this evil that has been done to me, this has been the result of it. This is how God worked this out for good. I said, I I listened to my wife's testimony and I see the evil done to her and how the Lord has worked that out for good in her life. And when you, when you see this and you stop and look at it, you think to yourself, well, will God do that in my life? Well, if you are called according to his purpose and you love God, yes, God will work out the greatest evils in your life and he will turn them around for good. You say, well, I haven't seen it yet. And I, this gentleman, he said it to me, he said, He said, I haven't seen it yet. 
And I said, well, you will. I said, you got to trust him that he can work these things out. And he will take it and he will turn it around for good. Now, that reveals the sovereignty of God. And so I encourage you, if you are, you question that, you question God's sovereignty, the only way you're going to see him work those things out for, for good is that you've got to trust him and you've got to follow him. That's it. That's the only way it's going to happen. If you turn in resentment and anger and hatred and you start treating people the way you've been treated, I guarantee you, uh, nothing's going to work out for you. You're, in fact, you're shooting yourself in the foot. It's only going to get worse. You're going to have one foot limping and you're going to shoot yourself in the other foot and the other one's going to be limping. So it, it, people say, well, it can't get any worse. And I tell them, oh, yes, it can. It, uh, it can. Don't, don't ever think that. It can get worse. And you just keep rebelling and it will keep getting worse surrender, and you will make that turnaround. And the turnaround will begin. So you got to trust him. Now notice how the Lord works this out for good. John here declares it here in verse 51. He says, now this he did not say on his own authority, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. And we know the fruit of what that brings. Then he says, and not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who are scattered abroad. Now, this is the ultimate good that comes from the incredible evil of the, the crucifixion of Christ. There's a resurrection of Christ. And then he gathers together those that will believe in him. So you and I are a part of that gathering together into one family, the family of God, children of God. We are the fruit, the good fruit that God has worked out in and through the life of Christ. So you are that fruit. Think about that for a minute. That is an incredible blessing that you have been called into the body of Christ. And you need to work to bring others into that body of Christ. Because that's what we are called to do. It is an amazing thing to watch and see how the Lord brings people from the most diverse backgrounds, diverse upbringings, and bring them into the body of Christ and make them one. I remember years ago I went and I uh, spoke for a friend of mine down in Southern California in Torrance. And I spoke at his church and I went to the back of the church as I usually do and just was there to shake hands with people as they left. And as people walked out, I realized, wow, this is an incredibly diverse church. There were whites, there were blacks, there were Samoans. There was, a, I mean, a huge uh, population of Samoans there in that area. Uh, and they're walking out and Asian people. And I mean, it's just an incredible thing. I saw people that were really very, looked very rich, very well-dressed, and other people who looked very poor. And I thought to myself, what a blessing that, all of these people can come together as one in the body of Christ. And I, I called the pastor up and I said, Brother, you, you need to be so thankful and, and blessed because that's, that is an incredibly good witness to your church. Now, and I understand you have to be in a community that is incredibly diverse to begin with to have a church that is very diverse. And he was very wise. He, he took individuals from each of those communities and he had them on staff with him. And I thought, wise, very wise. And he was ministering to people from so many different backgrounds. Now, why do I bring that up? 
You know, there is a, a great divide in our country today. I mean, you just listen to the evening news. I mean, our, our country is probably more divided racially and economically in so many different ways than we have been probably since the 60s, literally. And there is a reason for it. There really is. And you don't want to be a part of what is dividing people. You want to be a part of what is uniting people. Okay? Now that's really an important thing. And I really truly believe that the only real answer to the problem we have in our country today is the body of Christ. It really is. It's the only answer. Because Jesus came to die for men's sins and what is it that divides people? It's their sin. That's what divides people. It's their anger. It's their resentments. Their pride. And all of that has to be dealt with in Christ. And when that's dealt with in Christ, you can fellowship with anybody. If, if they've got the same love of Christ in them, it doesn't make any difference to you whether they are white or black or purple or blue or green. You are going to love them. You're going to have relationship with them. It doesn't make any difference whether they are young or old, whether they are rich or poor. It doesn't make any difference whether they are tatted or not tatted, whether they are pierced or whether they are unpierced. It doesn't make any difference to you. You could care less because you see through all of that and you see the person. You see the individual person. And that is what the Bible declares. In Galatians 3, 28, there Paul said, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ. Now that was a revolutionary statement made in the first century that probably gave Paul incredible heartburn from people that bugged him and hassled him. And they said to him, Jews and Greeks, I mean, they wouldn't have anything to do with each other. And slave or free? I'm free. You're a slave. What is that? Oh, that's, that's just arrogance, you see. Male or female? Well, in the first century, women were looked at as property. For Paul to say, you are equal with a man. Wow. That is really incredible statement. So for any of you ladies that say, well, you know, you, somebody that might come up to you at work and say, you know, Paul is a male chauvinist. Just read this verse to him. Just, just read this verse to him and just say, this is the way Paul viewed males and females. One. One in Christ. Very important. In Ephesians 2.14, there it says, for he himself is our peace. That's why I believe only the body of Christ is the solution. The only, where, only place where peace can be found. He himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of, of separation. And so this is what he does. He is our peace. And he, if you look in the context of that particular passage, he's talking about Jews and, and Gentiles. He's saying they are one, brought together as one. And that's what he wants to do. So when you sense somebody trying to separate you from others because of race or age or gender or something, you want, to, you want to stay away from that. You want to say, that is not the message of the gospel. That is not the message of Christ. He wants to bring about something completely opposite to that. Don't let people separate you into little groups. Or you're Calvary Chapel, so you can't fellowship with anybody else. Well, you can. You need to love 
one another as Christ loves you. That is the that is the message of the gospel. And so I encourage you, keep that mindset because it is essential. This is why he came. And you want to work for that same, same end. Now last here, notice that in the latter part of this paragraph here, it basically tells you that Jesus didn't walk openly any longer. Why? Because he knew that there was a clear plot to kill him. And so a person needs to use wisdom just as Jesus does. When you know that there is danger, don't be a fool. Don't walk and do and go someplace that you know is not safe. Don't be a fool because that's what you're doing. If Jesus removed himself from this situation, if Paul was let down in a basket and hightailed it out of town in Damascus, then there's no shame in going to some place where it's safe. So remember that principle because I think sometimes as Christians we don't, we don't use common sense a lot of times. And this is just plain common sense. Remember what he declares here. Now, will he come to Jerusalem? Yes, he will. But in his own time and for his own purpose. And that we will continue on as we study further. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your incredible grace, your incredible mercy that you have had towards each of us. Lord, each of us has a testimony of how you've changed us and just radically made us into new men, new women. Lord, we we just thank you for that. Lord, help us to recognize and remember all of the miracles that you have done. Those miracles of sending people into our path. Those miracles, Lord, of answered prayer. Those miracles, Lord, of of just how you have answered and, and provided for us. Lord, I, I pray that you would just help us to rejoice as we remember. Lord, and make us men and women that just, Lord, labor and fight for unity. Lord, where we are not sectioned into little groups. Lord, help us to see the, the bigger picture of the body of Christ. Help us to see that bigger picture right here in our own church. Lord, we believe you to do that. Lord, move in our midst. And Lord, fill us each with the love of Jesus Christ. Help us to love one another with a pure heart, fervently. Lord, in truth. Lord, not help us to stay away from being phony. Lord, help us to love sincerely. And we believe you to do that. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, you're not a Christian, you've never made that commitment to him, or maybe you have and you've, you've walked away, you have a decision to make, a decision that only you can make. Will you follow him? Will you serve him? Will you ask his forgiveness even now? I want to encourage you to do just that. You're here for a reason. You've heard this message for a reason. Will you respond? Will you turn to him? If you believe you're a sinner and you believe that Christ died for your sins, well, then what's keeping you from responding to him and receiving him? If you say nothing, then pray with me. Pray with me right now. Just say, Lord, I know I am a sinner. Say those words to him. I know I'm a sinner. I know I have broken your law. Forgive me. Jesus, come in. Take over my life. I want to follow you. I want to be your disciple. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. And change me. If you just prayed that prayer with me, will you confess yes 
acknowledge, yes, I prayed with you, Steve. By just simply lifting your hand here, simple acknowledgement. Yes, Steve, I prayed with you today. Anyone here? We'd like to pray for you. Thank you, Lord, for a great opportunity that you have set before each of us, Lord. That incredible opportunity to know you and to be saved. Lord, we rejoice in that salvation today. We give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen.